This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Check out bonus content relating to this video on my Nebula page. In 2016, the Juno spacecraft entered into an orbit of Jupiter and began sending back information about its atmosphere and magnetic field. This was the first time that a spacecraft had been put into a polar orbit of Jupiter, meaning that the probe saw every part of Jupiter, including its poles, as it orbited. And that meant we saw some things that we've never seen before. In particular, Juno made a bunch of discoveries about Jupiter's polar regions including this. You're looking at Jupiter's south pole in the infrared part of the spectrum, and a collection of beautiful swirls in its atmosphere. Each one of these is about 5,000 kilometers across, so the Earth's moon would easily fit inside each one. And when these were discovered, it was kind of a total surprise. Scientists knew there'd be something at Jupiter's poles, but weren't expecting this. To look at why it was surprising, let's quickly look at Earth's atmosphere and what happens over our poles. People who have watched the channel for a long time will know what's coming next because it's what I did my PhD on. It's the stratospheric polar vortex. Just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. This is a big donut of air, several thousand kilometers across in the middle atmosphere, that forms every winter in both the northern and southern hemispheres, ultimately driven by the temperature difference between the cold polar night and the warm equator. There's obviously a lot more complexity to it than that, and I've made some videos about some of those complexities, but basically it's just a circulation of air around the wintertime pole in the middle atmosphere, caused by the temperature difference between the wintertime pole and the equator. Quite simple, really. But Earth is not alone. In fact, pretty much every planet and moon that we know of that has an atmosphere also has a polar vortex. And they're all a bit different. Venus's thick atmosphere has a polar vortex that's similar to Earth's, but lasts all year long, with a complicated central circulation within the vortex. Mars has a polar vortex that extends much further down towards the surface, not what we see on Earth at all. And Saturn has one that's hexagonal. That's a long way on the scale of atmospheric weirdness from Earth's kind of vanilla donut of rotating air to Saturn's Settlers of Catan tile. With all that variety, are these all really the same phenomenon? And what do we really mean when we call something a polar vortex? We thought a lot about this when we wrote the paper and we thought, how do you define polar vortex? And then we thought, well, let's split it up. How do you define polar? That's not even very obvious. How do you define vortex? Well, just a spinny thing. This is Professor Dan Mitchell at the University of Bristol, who, along with his co-authors, just published a paper reviewing all the polar vortices we know about, and tried to make sense of what connects them all. If you break it down to its constituent parts, then actually a vortex is, is, a, is an air mass that rotates around the central point. And so we've just vaguely put that in as a definition and then said if it appears in the polar region and sort of leave, leave it up to you to understand what that polar region really means. In fact, in order to have a physics-based definition, Dan had to make use of a property of an atmosphere called its Rosby deformation radius, which is just a length, it's a number that you can calculate. For Earth, for example, in the middle atmosphere, it's a couple of thousand kilometers. So that basically means if you've got a rotating fluid, say a very large one on a planet, if something happens on one side of that fluid, is it felt on the other side? So a, a counter example where it's not the case is the Earth's jet stream. If we get a wobble in one side of the jet stream, say over Europe, we won't necessarily get one uh, over the other side. If there is some influence from one side to the other, then we thought that defines a polar vortex, because that means it's a coherent structure. If there's a wobble on one side, then you'll get it on the other side. This is really beautiful to me, because it's a wonderful example of how the laws of physics are the same everywhere. We can describe how any atmosphere of any planet or any moon behaves using the same set of equations. And each planet or moon is unique because of the unique combination of parameters, of numbers, that we put into these equations. But they all obey the same laws. They can all be described using the same ideas, like the Rosby deformation radius. Anyway. 
I digress. Using this definition, with a slight problem on Saturn's moon Titan that we won't get into, you can construct a theory that describes how polar vortices form and behave on all planets and moons. That's what Dan's review paper is all about. So what's going on with Jupiter? It was only uh, when Juno arrived, it's in polar orbit, so it circles around the poles, and they could look in the visible. And first of all, when you saw the images of the visible, they were just amazing, you know, fascinating things. And they gave a hint of these huge polar vortices. But it was only when we looked in the infrared, which penetrated through the visible layer to the deeper layer of, of Jupiter, we saw these vortex clusters and, and every scientist just sort of put up their hands and were like, well, what's this? We have no idea. Rather than just one polar vortex like Earth or Mars or Saturn or, well, anything else we've seen before, Jupiter has a cluster of them. Each one is a circulation in the polar region within the length scale of the Rosby deformation radius for Jupiter, and so a coherent structure. Each one of these is a polar vortex. So at Jupiter, it does have a central polar vortex still. So that is a central polar vortex and it's surrounded by slightly smaller um, polar vortices and that creates a cluster. How is that different from the other polar vortices? Well, it's stable like the other polar vortices, but we do see migration of what's going on in Jupiter. So we see some, some polar vortices from closer to the equator migrate up and then just push their way into these clusters and that forms a new configuration. But that central polar vortex is always very stable in presence, so that's more analogous to the other um, planets. Jupiter was what motivated me to write the review paper. It's just a natural polar vortex, which you couldn't imagine unless you saw it, and that's why I really love Jupiter's polar vortex. Jupiter has a cluster of polar vortices at each pole. Unexpected, and there's plenty of unanswered questions about them, but ultimately, they're explainable using the same laws of physics that we use here on Earth to describe our polar vortex. This is a polar vortex just as much as this is. But here's the really cool bit. There's probably even weirder stuff out there, and we may just be about to find out about it. I would like to see if there are polar vortex clusters or even something more exciting on exoplanets. That's where, it, you know, that's where it's really interesting and that's what's great about the recent launch of the James Webb Telescope. We won't be able to directly observe polar vortex with that telescope, it's not powerful enough, but we'll get some pretty cool spectra out of it. And we might be able to say, hey, there looks like there's some clusters on this planet or, or actually there's something e even more fun that we hadn't even considered, just like when we discovered the Jupiter polar vortices and we hadn't considered it. So I mentioned that there was a slight complication with Dan's classification of polar vortices on Titan, Saturn's moon. Dan talks about this and a bunch of other fascinating topics, which unfortunately I just couldn't fit into this video, in an extended interview on Nebula. You've almost certainly heard of Nebula before. It's the streaming service owned by a huge collection of educational YouTubers, including me, where we upload additional content that wouldn't play nicely with the YouTube algorithm, as well as original content such as next level world building and the feature length Alaska's Silent Summer from Wendover Productions. Unlike YouTube, Nebula has no adverts whatsoever on its pages or anywhere in its videos. Instead, you just pay a subscription fee that then gets split up between us creators, supporting our work. Except you can get completely free access to Nebula if you sign up to our partner's Curiosity Stream. And why wouldn't you? If you've watched this video this far, you're clearly a curious person, and so would love the thousands of documentaries on Curiosity Stream. In particular, you may enjoy Destination Jupiter about the Juno mission, or Zenith advances in space exploration, or perhaps something about economics, or military history, or sperm whales. There's just so much to choose from. If Nebula is the best of small scale indie productions, then Curiosity Stream is the best of big scale professional productions. So it makes perfect sense to get the best of both worlds in a bundle, which you can do at curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark, link below, which also gives you a 26% discount. That means it's $1.24 a month for access to all of this and all of this. It's possibly the best investment you'll ever make 
in your online experience and in supporting educational video. That's curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark with thanks to CuriosityStream and Nebula for sponsoring this video. Thank you for watching the video right the way to the end. I tried something a little different with this. I wanted to go for a slightly broader audience than normal. So this is a very complicated topic that I tried to tell as simply as possible. Let me know what you thought in the comments. Thank you to Dan for taking part in this video and for pointing me to his paper. The interview we did was so interesting. I think there's probably going to be a couple of other videos based on it coming forwards. So you've not seen the last of Dan. Whereas if you enjoyed this video, please do pop it a like and share it with people that you think may also find it interesting. If you're staying here on YouTube, then here's some recommended viewing next. And that just leaves me to say thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.